I'm Brent Ersenbach. I work for Salt Lake County as a code official. I'm a retired HVAC contractor. I've spent my whole life involved in energy conservation and energy use in buildings. The building codes are a whole set of codes. We have building, plumbing, mechanical, electrical, and in more recent years, also energy code. The energy code for residential buildings focuses on the building envelope. We're talking today mostly about the lighting requirements which apply to the commercial energy code. The commercial energy code deals with the envelope, how well you insulate the building, the mechanical systems, those HVAC systems that heat and cool your building, and lighting systems, the controls of lights, the type of lights, and also we deal with service water heating, making hot water in certain applications, like a hotel you make a lot of hot water, and also with motors, elevators, escalators. I'm uh, Jody Good. I'm a lighting designer with Spectrum Engineers here in Salt Lake City. I uh, earned my living for many years designing lighting and lighting controls for uh, building owners and folks like that. Both the IECC and the ASHRAE IES 90.1 energy code for commercial applications contain limitations on the amount of wattage you can use and the requirements for the controls that you can use both for interior and exterior lighting. Department of Energy has been the force behind moving energy codes forward and the International Energy Conservation Code, the IECC, is one of the I codes that, that we adopt in, in states across the country. The IECC though, however, has an option that you can also use ASHRAE 90.1 2013, which is the American Society of Heating, Air, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, and you can use either one of those code books to show compliance with the energy code. The Illuminating Engineering Society participates in the lighting section of the ASHRAE IES 90.1 code. The IECC code is a code developed by the International Code Council. They differ in their source. They don't differ much in their content anymore, although they do renew on different cycles, so they sometimes leapfrog each other. But you will find that the IECC being referenced in the IBC, the building code, is the law to get your building permit and your certificate of occupancy. But the IECC has a escape clause where the design team can go to the ASHRAE code the ASHRAE IES code and use it to uh, instead of the IECC for energy compliance. The code gives you the direction to either use the IECC or ASHRAE. It is up to the design team, the design professionals, to decide which path they want to choose. One important concept that they have to keep in mind though is if you're going to use the IECC you use it for the envelope, you use it for the mechanical, and you also use it for the lighting and the other ones. You, if you choose ASHRAE, you use ASHRAE for all of them. You can't use part IECC and part ASHRAE. It has to be a decision of the design team. The architect, the mechanical engineer, and the lighting um, designer, for the most part, have to decide which code to choose. You can't do one part of the building on one code and another part of the building on another code anymore. That got clarified a few years ago. So they pick which code to go for. And in some cases, the if the architect's got a lot of windows, for instance, they may decide they want to go one way. If it's an office building and we don't want to switch outlets, they may decide to go an another way. It's a matter of st what strategy the design team wants to take. The prescriptive requirements in the IECC, and this is similar in ASHRAE, but in the IECC we have a set of prescriptive requirements and it gives a specific direction. You'll have, depending on your climate, a certain amount of insulation in the walls, a certain amount in the roof, certain type of windows, and it's kind of a recipe. You just follow and you meet all those requirements. We then have the mechanical requirements. You have to have a certain efficiency in your heating and cooling equipment and your fan motors and such that are in those pieces of equipment. Same thing with your lighting. You have specific allowances. You're allowed so many watts per square foot depending on the type of occupancy or type of use. And so it's kind of prescriptive list. You know, you do this, 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 and this. You can do some trading off, which means if you have a weaker window, you can increase the insulation in another part and trade off. The advanced energy options contained in the code 
as Brent says, frequently lighting is used today. That's because we're using LEDs today in commercial design. And that gives us the benefit of a lower, an intrinsically lower watts per square foot technology. And we're able to meet that fairly easily. I think in the, one of the differences we'll see in the next energy, in the next code update, is that those watts per square foot will start to tighten down a little bit because we'll be leaving what was allowed with fluorescent and pushing the uh, energy targets to LED. There's also a controls option that you can use and it requires networked or at least digital controls, more sophisticated controls. You really can't put a light in a building today without controlling it. The enhanced energy options include a lighting control option, which just requires us to use more advanced controls. The energy code has recognized that windows and skylights are an important part of lighting efficiency. In other words, we can use outside natural light versus producing artificial light inside. And so the code has now recognized that if we can use this daylight, we create daylight zones and we have controls so that we turn off lights when we can use daylight and we can have some real increases in efficiency. You know, save a lot of energy if we can use daylight rather than artificial lighting. One of the differences between the IECC and the IES, ASHRAE IES 90.1 used to be that the IECC only did whole building modeling. And today we can do either space by space or whole building modeling, which is the technique that the ASHRAE IES has used for many years. So it's a, uh, it's a good way of giving the design team the option of doing a space by space analysis of the building, which gives them a little bit more flexibility in their allocating their watts per square foot, or if they're in a hurry or they don't have an energy problem, they can do the whole building and do it very quickly. From my perspective, one of the most important changes in the codes this time is that any changes to lighting in a space that involves more than 10% of the lights has to be brought up to code. It used to be 50%, people were skating and whatever, but I believe that, the app, I believe that codes are a moral item. It is our obligation to design for a client the best facility we can. And this 10% means, a new 10% criteria, means that we can give them better buildings. Lighting controls continues to be the biggest confusion in the application of these energy codes. Every light has to be controlled. There's a way of doing it. There's ways that have changed over time. For instance, in rooms that private offices and conference rooms and so forth, you now have to go in and manually turn the lights on instead of just walking in and the lights coming on because a lot of times you don't need the lights to be on or you want to be able to turn them off because of the function of the room. So the, the applicability of lighting controls is still a big confusion that we spend a lot of time stepping owners through the process and their options. I'm more familiar with the, uh, the next code of the, I, the ISHRAE IES 90.1 and in that code, the, the watts per square foot or the allowable energy will be notched down to leave the world of efficient fluorescent lighting and go to the LED world. And that means that we'll be saving, eventually we'll be saving 20 to 30% more energy just by adopting LED technology and the codes will follow. A big understanding about, misunderstanding about lighting codes is, is that people think that it's pushing people towards imagination, imaginary technology. And it's not really. It's all based on real world jobs. There's over 99 uh, new, uh, ap new applications that are evaluated for this next code cycle. And the, and the actual watts per square foot are measured and that's where the codes are moved to. It's not theoretical, it's not imaginary, it's stuff that has actually happened. And then we adopt it, put it in the code, and expect people to comply with these more efficient technologies. New in the past two code cycles in the IECC, we've had the prescriptive requirements that you meet this for the envelope and so on, like I discussed before. But at the end of that section of the code, they say, okay, let's do something even a little bit more efficient, an alternate or an enhanced energy efficiency practice. And previously, last code cycle, they gave you three options. With the 2015 code, we now have six options. Most important is that they select one of those up front when they're designing the building 
and most typically now it's they pick a lighting option where they use even less power per square foot or they use enhanced lighting controls that do automatic switching and turning on and off of lights. It's interesting when we consider lighting, we have a tendency in, in our country and in the world now to provide lots of light outside. And part of the, the problem with that is we can't see the stars anymore. I enjoy it when I go out, of, out into the mountains where there's no artificial light or light pollution as I like to call it, where you can see millions of stars. In Utah, we live in a, the single most concentrated location of dark sky parks in the country. A lot of that is, is because all of our big five national parks have adopted a dark sky philosophy and some of them have implemented it already. So that means that in many of our rural areas, like Brent says, in our away from the cities areas, you can still see the, sky, the stars. And in fact, we have a, surprisingly, we have a dark sky park on the back side of the Wasatch up in Weber County. So you don't have to go very far to have the night sky preserved. But what that means is, is that ordinances are being adopted by communities to preserve this. They are saving the, the sky from sky glow. They're eliminating lighting to your neighbor's facility or their front yard. And so light trespass and, and sky glow are being controlled by lighting ordinances. And those are not adopted on a state or even a county basis. They're adopted by a local community getting involved. And it's important, to, in my mind, it's important to try to save this because the sky, the night sky is gorgeous. And if you can pull over to the road like Brent says he does, or like I do, and you from the bottom of the Grand Canyon, and you can see millions of, sky, of stars in the dark sky, it's something to behold.